Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. I'm Adam Alsergani, here today with Ingrid Wenzel. Hi. Matthew Schmidt. Hello. As well as Hera the Dog, Phantom the Cat, Zoe the Bird, and the little man who sculpts the ice in our freezer, any of whom may insinuate themselves into the conversation at their will. Today we'll be discussing The Distance of the Moon by Italo Calvino. It's a story published several ways across languages, collections, and anthologies. We're working from the 1968 William Weaver translation, the first English publication of this first story and the first set of Cosmic Comics, at least so far as I know. The Cosmic Comics were an ongoing project of Calvino's. It was decades long, wherein he constructed a story around a scientific fact or hypothesis In this case, a theory he attributes to Darwin that the moon once orbited the Earth more closely than it does now until tidal forces pushed that orbit farther outward to its present circumference. Like most of the cosmic comics, the distance of the moon is primarily narrated by... I'm going to pronounce it Kifwith. Uh, It's spelled Q-F-W-F-Q, who's a congenital know-it-all and feels compelled to answer Calvino's scientific assertions with stories from his direct experience, which he will claim across the stories in a novel to be an experience beginning pre-Big Bang inside a gravitational singularity and traversing time and space and through forms of evolution as a fish, as a dinosaur, etc. Arriving, we can only presume, in some modern humanoid form. In this story, The Distance of the Moon, Kifwif is human-ish. He is, anyway, in company with personified seafarers who, on the moon's monthly rounds, sail under it and send participants up to collect what they refer to as moon milk from the moon's scales. Uh, Moon milk, by the way, is a pasty substance made from bitumen, fish stuff, other matter that is drawn onto the moon by its gravitational pull where all that stuff ferments. Much of the story is operational. We learn about the moon, the moon's milk, the facts of the process of retrieving the moon's milk, but the plot surrounds Kifwifk, his deaf cousin, who he refers to as the deaf one, and the captain's wife, who I'm going to call Mrs. Vivid. Um, It's spelled Mrs. VHD VHD. Uh, Kifwifk is drawn to Mrs. Vivid. The deaf one, the story term is the deaf one, uh, is drawn to the moon itself, and Mrs. Vivid is drawn to the deaf one. Uh, Amidst this disastrous gravitational love triangle, the moon begins to move away from Earth, pushed away by that tidal force um, from the proposition at the beginning of the story. The especially deft deaf one plays with the moon as a last goodbye, jumping up, spinning around, while Mrs. Vidvid, trying to join him, ends up on the moon with Kifwif for a month, only to decide to stay on the moon forever. At least that's Kifwif's assertion. That's what he believes. Um... And he believes that she does that for the deft one. And all of this is told through Kifwif's memories and beliefs, um, which I think is important. Um, That's what I'd like to discuss first. Before we get there, is there anything I've missed that's essential to this conversation? Uh, I know that's a lot of (laughs) bizarro stuff. I don't know that this is essential, but one thing that I would just add for clarification is that Concerning um, the story's fact, the fact that the story goes out of um, that the moon was once closer to the, wor- the to the Earth, um, that's attributed to Sir George H. Darwin, not Charles Darwin, right. who's who I think of as yeah, the yeah, Darwin. Yeah. The so. Darwin, yeah, that's fair. Word. Um, in that case, but other than that, yeah, yeah no, on. that's a a worthwhile note. <laughs> Um, in that case, let's talk Kifwif. Who is he? Why is he telling the story? Uh, should we believe him on any topic at all? Um, and this seems especially important because 
is, in my opinion, kind of creepy uh, preoccupation with Mrs. Bidbit overtakes a story that might be invested in all kinds of other things going on in this pre-moon distancing world. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to claim that I know exactly who Kiffwiff is. Um, he is old. That is the one fact besides his name that I really know from the story. And it's he's old because the writer, whoever's putting down Kipwiff's tale, the only thing that they actually write is old Kipwiff cried. <laughs> yeah. Everything else is actually like basically dialogue from Kipwiff or his memories of the dialogue between other characters, himself, etc. Uh, so we know he's old. We know kind of what his name is. Um, and we know, I guess, that at one time he was part of this seafaring group in some aspect, um, which is maybe not clear. I think the one other thing that's important, to me at least, is uh, he's talking to younger people. Um, and this seems like a group outing because he responds to questions along the way. Um, and part of the reason it's procedural, as you've said, is that he's trying to explain how things actually happened to these younger listeners, uh, about how the moon eventually, uh, removed itself from being as close to the Earth as supposedly it was. On the, on, the, on the front of whether or not to believe him, I think he, he mostly reminds me of uh, that, you know, overzealous uncle that knows everything. Yeah. Right, so like, you know, where the, where the uncle's telling you, you know, oh yeah, this happened, and no matter what you say, like, that uncle will contradict you whether it's fact or, or perceived fact or not, right? Yeah. Like, just straight contradiction. Yeah. And so I think you have to believe some of him. The question is, like, how much do you believe? Yeah. Like, it's, it's based, in fact, in his mind. Um, and his mind, I think, uh, obviously has gone through some changes if he's as old as this story makes him out to be. Like, um... You know, he is very detailed in his descriptions of how they mined moon milk um, and in how everyone got up there and got back. Um, but the thing that he really remembers the most is his uh, lust for Mrs. Vidvid. Because at first, like, he's just kind of like, jumping around and, like, telling parts of uh, what it was like back then and, like, how they went about their mining of the moon milk. And then, like, the second half of the story is just, like, him focused on Mrs. Vidvid. So I'm trusting more of the second half because, as you astutely point out, of the gravitational love triangle, which I think is really important here, and that different things pull and push and the barriers that are crossed really, I think, have a significance in the story. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear you thinking out that you trust him more in the second half. I'm, I'm hoping we can explore that, but it looks like Ingrid has some thoughts, so... Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you describe him as a character and in terms of um, the kind of storyteller that he is very well, Matthew. Um, you know, early on, he presents himself as a sort of memory broker. We get questions from, from younger characters, definitely, like you say, and we have access to the questions we don't have any access to who those characters are though 
Um, and, you know, I mean, he presents himself as unreliable almost immediately. The first line of the story is, how well I know old QFWFQ cried. I'm going to use the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's um, the rest of you can't remember, but I can. Um, so, you know, he's asserting himself as the authority on this subject, but, but within the first page, we also get these two quotes. But the whole business of the moon's phases worked in a different way then, because the distances from the sun were different, and the orbit, and the angle of something or other, I forget what. <laughs> so, you know, his, his specificity is already faltering. Um, we also get this line, and these lines, um, this is how we did the job, um, referring to kind of putting some of the phosphorescent things back up, or pulling them down, rather. Um, in the boat, we had the ladder. One person held it, another person climbed it, a third rowed. Um, and that was why there had to be so many of us. So here he's attempting to explain something, but there are five people on the boat, and he's describing three jobs. So already I'm going, hmm. Um, I think he gets more vocal about unreliability and uncertainty in the second half of the story. He yeah. begins to talk a lot about doubt, about wondering what one character's or another's intentions are. Um, and, I mean, he... You, I, I think I know what you mean, Matthew, about trusting him more in that second half. Um, for me, it's a little bit of a mixed bag in that I think because he vocalizes uncertainty, I feel like I'm getting something closer to the facts. However, at the same time, he does a lot of um, what um, cognitive therapy would describe as fortune-telling, where he, he introduces that uncertainty, but then he goes on to kind of speculate wildly about you know, what someone's motives might be, and then to sometimes reassert certainty. So I think I feel more confident as a reader because I feel like I have a good read on him, that he introduces that certainty, and that I don't trust those speculations. Um, that said, I think as a character like, like you, Matthew, I don't distrust everything he's telling me. I think his descriptions of a special, especially physical movement and procedure, I feel like I can see where, where I might have doubts around them, like when he describes the distance that you'd have to reach to a moon as if everyone's the same height, then I doubt it. But when he's describing a particular move that someone makes to launch off of the moon or to get onto it, I, I do end up believing that. Um, in terms of who he is, I think he's first and foremost the storyteller. That's the main thing we know about him. We don't know, we know about his actions and the things that he does. Within the context of this story, we don't know much, and this is this we'll talk about a little later, I think, Adam, um, but we don't know much about what the other options in this world would be, what he is as opposed to what he could be. Um, and then, lastly, you asked us, um, why is he telling this story? Um, that one got me really interested. I think at first this story reads a lot like it's going to be almost kind of a myth where it explains something about the moon or about how things were at a particular time. Um, but as the story wears on, um, about midway through, um, not quite midway through, we get this line. This is how the story of my love for the captain's wife began and my suffering. Um, and at that point, I start to think, well, is this a myth? Is that what we're doing here? Or is this about figuring out something about this time in his life and this love? Um, and, you know, I mean, I think increasingly the story becomes about speculating about her feelings and her needs and her wants and his own at that time, how he did certain things. I um, just want to quote one more thing. Um, so this comes from page 12 of our edition. Um, let's see. Oh, 
I was so absorbed, I didn't realize at first that I was indeed tearing from her her weightless condition, but was making her fall back on the moon. Didn't I realize it? Or had that been my intention from the very beginning? Before I could think properly, a cry was already bursting from my throat. I'll be the one to stay with you for a month. Or rather, on you, I shouted in my excitement. On you for a month. And at that moment, our embrace was broken by our fall to the moon's surface, where we rolled away from each other among those cold scales. Um, so just to clarify, this is a moment where um, the moon's forces have changed and um, the, the narrator is trying to pull Mrs. Vidvid from the moon, um, but she's actually falling back toward it. And so he's kind of falling back with her. But I think this, this moment where he's, he's thinking out what he said and kind of reframing that as he goes, for me, feels like one of the things that the story is about. I think it actually also is a kind of myth. Um, but, you know, I'd be curious to hear your two thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to stay with this and kind of expand it in general because... Right, like, as you mentioned, the story is kind of broken into two halves, and I, I don't know that I like the term speculative fiction, or that that feels entirely right ever, but um, not here either, right? Like, we're, the, the sort of process that Calvino is operating under is I'm taking something that's like science to the degree that we understand something at the moment of, you know, 1960, whatever, um, as he's writing one of these stories, and he's putting that down. And then he's trying to narrativize scientific facts, which are often a little bit ephemeral, right? And as a result, we're getting operational things, rules of the story, and the way that he's managing some of that is, you know... Letting certain things just live in ambiguity, which mm -hmm. is the kind of yeah. irony. Um, and the most traditional aspect of the story is the love triangle um, that progresses out of that, that other kind of more operational, speculative conversation. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we can think through how that works as a structure, how that story is told and how's that changed by the story's relationship to time, right? Like to be in love with Mrs. Vidbid or to immediately desire her backside or to like fall onto the moon with her, right? Those are all things in, in a present moment or a present moment of the kind to forget is a thing that happens in a normal human kind of process of time and to rethink and to like, play on words a little grotesquely, like, I'm um, the one to stay on you, right? Um, but then there's this other kind of sense of time and change that's happening, and I'm hoping you two can help me put all those things together. Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, to answer maybe one of those questions, like, the fact that he comes back to retell the story later and say, on you, like, to like insert that doesn't just mean on Mrs. Vidvid to me. It means on the moon, mm. which by the end of the story, he's imagining Mrs. Vidvid is like part of the moon. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that the time factor does. Yeah. Uh, another thing is, I think, that this is a moment where he's in a group setting and he's trying to use his age and supposed knowledge to his value, right? There's, there's value in leading the conversation. There's value in having people listen to you, right? It's, it's cultural cachet. And, and so he's, that's why I said like, you know, at the beginning, he's kind of trying to find his way in. And like the beginning of the book, of the story, how well I know, right? Like, is automatically a like a bravado mm -hmm. like opening yeah, yeah. where he's just like 
trying to be the loudest and, and say, listen to me, I know this. Right. And so, like, I think he moves around these procedural things about mining the moon um, kind of like in a stop-start type of way where he will start to say something and then he'll like kind of branch off and do something else and then come back to a thing. Um, and he does that a couple of times before he gets to the real story. And that's why I trust him more in the second half because the real story that he's telling started to me as a myth. Right. And, and, and then it moves to like his desires. Um, not to say that that also is not a myth because right the love triangle is is probably a true thing but like in a certain respect you know that's suggesting that there's straight lines from person A to person B right. to person C which is not true yeah okay so like in that way it's a myth too but i think i'm more in tune with his ideas of gravitation yeah in the second half and that's why I trust him more because he tells a story in a way that puts him kind of in a bad light yeah and he finally gets the thing he wants a month alone with Mrs. Bidfit and yet he hates it <laughs> it's the worst month of his life and that's because Nothing really to do with Mrs. Vidvid necessarily, but he understands that this is not where he is supposed to be. Okay. His pull is from the earth. The moon is not pulling him. He only went to the moon to follow Mrs. Vidvid based on his desire. And he realizes that desire is, you know, somehow false. Yeah. Obviously, Mrs. Vidvid has something to do with that. Obviously, his cousin, the deaf one, has something to do with that. But, like, thinking about the barriers between people and then the barriers between, you know, uh, planet and moon, I, th I find really interesting. And that's where I'm, like, thinking more about his truthfulness in storytelling. And that, like, he lays out, uh, you know, all these things. And it certainly could be a ploy to uh, have his listeners, you know, like him more for like showing his uh, you know deficiency or, or, or unsuccessfulness or lucklessness whatever you want to call it but you know I think he's always embellishing things throughout the story and so that's that, I guess that's kind of what makes me say what I said earlier about the second half yeah um, when you two say myth right like I think there's, there's the kind of myth that, like, that somehow a love triangle is a thing because there's a string between me and you and you and Ingrid and me and Ingrid in some way and that they don't have intersections and that there's straight lines and that there's no one else involved and, and so on and so forth. But then there's... I think the, the other one you're saying is that somehow there's the scientific, quote, fact, end quote, like, notably some of, across the cosmic comics, some of the scientific facts are untrue or we believe them to be untrue now. But then but what you're talking about is I understand that you're saying that like what Calvino is doing or what Kifwif via Calvino is doing is creating a mythos because he's personifying and building a story around the kind of knowable things in the way that like presumably early man was like looking at the moon and going why does this happen and, and telling stories about say the moon some kind of hypothetical yeah I mean I think it's a little bit of both yeah um and like I think one of the other things that uh Calvino slash Kifwith is doing is you know science allows us to learn and understand things better mm -hmm. but is continually changing. Sure. In, in the fact that, like, you know, who am I to say, like, that the moon wasn't closer to the sun? I have to, I don't have that knowledge. I don't have that research. Um, 
And so, like, sure, I'll believe it for, for, for the story. But, like, you know, I think it's partly, like, looking at what proposed facts were at a certain point and then, like, reimagining what those facts might have been or what could have happened. Um, because no one knows. Like, people still argue whether the Earth is round or flat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we haven't gotten over that. Yeah. And that's been going on for centuries. And so, like, I think one of the things happening here is, like, you know, it, it, in some ways, it, it's writing that line between, you know, fiction and nonfiction that we discussed uh, with... Uh, uh, Ambrose Edelvard. Yeah, yeah, Ambrose Edelvard. And, you know, it, it does it in a different way by, like, postulating a possible story, <laughs> which is, is fun and entertaining and amusing in a different way. And nonetheless, like, also, I think, touches on the fact of religion just based on the type of thing it is. Yeah. And I think that's one of the popular things about myth is like often storytellers of all kinds keep going back to like the same types of tropes and the same types of mythic ideas mm. and looking at them differently and then you know in turn that questions the reader's belief or beliefs that they have now or have had in their life yeah. or have read about that other people have Right, and so it's this strangely interconnectedness of ideas and thoughts and bodies, like orbiting each other, both on and off the earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I thought about this like a little differently, um, but also you know had some similar ideas too. So I'll try to, you know, touch on both. Um, so you asked him, how is the story told? Um, and I, I actually like, thought a little bit about the mechanics of it. So, I mean, the first thing that we get is the fact that you mentioned in italics, um, which kind of prepares us as readers for the fact that we're going to be talking about the moon and a time at which it's close to Earth. And then we get that first line, how well I know old QFWQ cried. The rest of you can't remember, but I can. So, I mean, he doesn't say I can't remember the time when the moon was closer to the earth. He's starting more in Medias race. Um, and at the beginning of the story, we do get him answering some questions, like I said, from unknown characters' orbit. Oh, elliptical, of course. So we get responses like that. And, I mean, my first thought on first read is, if the whole story is like this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, what it does is, I, I would say in that first part especially, like, establish the world that we're dealing with and really describe it in such imaginative terms um, you know we get beautiful images and of what the moon looks like of what the water looks like of what this space would be at night and I mean just these strange um, kind of otherworldly only Calvino like concoctions um, and like Matthew I start to notice in, in the first part that there's a lot on gravitation and on I mean, I also think of gravity as attraction, attraction to the earth and the pull of it, right? Um, so I think when, when I come to the speculation that we get in the second half and the sort of the different characters who are attracted to each other, um, QF, QFWFQ to Mrs. Vidvid, um, Mrs. Vidvid to um, um, QF, <laughs> QFWFQ's um, deaf cousin, um, 
the cousin to the moon, Mrs. Vidvid to the moon, um, these different forces between the characters. Um, I start thinking as, about the story as one that's about that force and how it operates for all different kinds of characters. And, I mean, the moon is certainly a character here. I also think about some... I also think about where we end up and the fact that, you know, turning to your question about how is this story shaped by the broad conception of time, yeah. I think about the fact that, you know, we, we know that the narrator begins to think of Mrs. Vidvid and the moon as one, but that doesn't inform how he tells this story from the outset. He's figuring it out as he goes along, and he's he's speculating on his own thoughts as he goes along. So, I mean, I think, for me, it's, it's a story that's about attraction, about memory, and kind of about like figuring out memory and the way that we tell stories when we're figuring things out and explaining things to ourselves. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think I think how it's told really emphasizes that aspect, that it is a reflective story that's going to be about understanding itself better over time, kind of. Yeah, I think that for me, thinking about this story has been a little bit about Matthew and I have been entertaining ourselves in the evening just watching old Bob Ross videos. And I think this story works for me a little like a Bob Ross painting. Like, it always starts from the back in the farthest point and kind of gets painted at you mm-hmm. until, it, like, you're in the scene, and that's the kind of strategy of his approach. Um, so I, as I was writing these questions, I was thinking about uh, how to sort of work through that Bob Ross process of Calvino's uh, to make a deeply confusing metaphor. <laughs> And in that way, I think, right, over time, we actually do get closer to the characters. So I'm hoping we can work through some of the characters as well and discuss how they're presented. I think there are two... There's Kifwifk um, himself, QFWFQ, and um, Mrs. Vidvid, who never really gets as much voice as one would hope or much embodiment. There's a lot of his gravitational pull Mm -hmm. toward her. Um, But then early on in the kind of first descriptive half of the story as we're learning about how the moon gets milked, um, there's a child whose name is Little... I'm pronouncing it Zithlip. uh, XL... THLX, um, who is a, a talented jumper, um, like the deaf one, who's a talented jumper, who's, I think, the sort of other dominant character in the second half, right? So there's some kind of parallelism between them, both in that they're seen by their difference, right? Uh, her, like, Zithlith being small, the deaf one being deaf, um, their ability as moon jumpers um, and their relative silence in the stories. I wanted to bring up Zithlith also, <laughs> Zithlith also uh, because I've, you know, I've read a lot of the, the cosmic comics over time and I'm a big fan of a lot of them. Uh, this one has stuck with me forever in part because uh, Zithlith suspended in the air between the competing gravitational forces of the earth and the moon and all these little fish and and things uh, floating up around her and her hair rising up has stuck with me and it's it's i don't know it's fascinating to me that kind of painting of an image um i have a million thoughts and questions about the use of those images and others and presentation of character here um, I think I wanted to bring up image in relation to those characters because so many of them don't speak or they don't speak much uh, that it's worth thinking out the ways in which we're going to encounter them uh, but rather than ask a million questions I thought I'd offer up the use of images and difference as a starting place and let the two of you guide me through your thoughts um, especially as they mention
Um, yeah, I thought about this differently over time. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. I don't know that I, I would have tracked this in, in quite the way I ended up doing had it not been for you. So thank you. Um, so I think at first, um, when the narrator introduces his cousin as the deaf one um, and kind of harps on that um, as a way to define him, I'm not sure what to do with it, and I feel um, kind of skeptical and put off, honestly. Um, and, I mean, I think the first question I, I asked myself was, like, is there any reason to define him in this way? Um, like, definitionally, is there something that's happening to this character that means that I need to know he's deaf? Um, like, would would I, from how how this character is describing is getting described, understand that he's deaf? And at first, the answer is no. Um, so the first quote I pulled is, "My cousin, the deaf one, showed a special talent for making these those leaps." His clumsy hands, as soon as they touched the lunar surface, he was always the first to jump up from the ladder, suddenly became deft and sensitive. Um, he's often described more as clumsy in terms of like how he uses his body than in terms of deafness. And I'm like, okay, like why, why the fixation with this? Why title him in this way? Um, as I moved on... Um, and though I did notice more moments where his deafness is, is more of a factor. Um, so the first big one is a speculative one. Nothing could separate her, hers, Mrs. Bitbit here, from the deaf one, from the deaf one um, than the sound of the harp. Um, so Mrs. Vivid is often playing a harp, and um, I think f for the narrator, like that sound becomes perhaps a point of connection, a way for them to meet. Um, and then later we get, but perhaps my cousin, deaf as he was, hadn't understood anything of what she tried to explain to him. This is in reference to. Um, the point in which she tries to follow the deaf one to the moon and perhaps stay there with him. Um, so, you know, I mean, being deaf, he can't hear her plan, her feelings, that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think I thought in terms of... in terms of that a little bit, um, and, I mean, I also started to think too out of the box a little bit I was like okay well I mean in stories all the time like you, we can't describe fully who a particular character is and we often default to describing part of that character in terms of appearance in terms of mannerism in terms of what they do um, that's usual this story also operates a little more like a fairy tale so I mean is this description archetypal um and then I, th I started thinking a little bit about tragic flaw. And, I mean, this is probably a little bit of a stretch, but bear with me, because I, I got a little interested in it. Um, I, I read recently that tragic flaw is not actually about um, a character's inability to do something. Like, the flaw isn't actually flaw. It's kind of a misnomer. In fact, it's more about, like, circumstance getting in the way. And I started to think about the deaf one in terms of that, like, inability to communicate with Mrs. Vidvid coming from the narrator's perspective as being potentially tragic, like the way they were missing each other. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, isn't that an interesting read? Um, and then in terms of... God, I... I don't even know how to mirror your pronunciation anymore. Um, in terms of XLTTLX, um, I, th I think um, for me that image um, of her suspended and all the smaller sea-like things getting drawn to her body and leaving a particular kind of impact on her was one of the story's more striking moments um, and one where 
um, I think Calvino gets away from like explaining action and what's happening and he's already in his own world and you know we understand how things work and so we get to see like the beauty of that world sort of play out for us in image um i think he, he has a real talent in this story for describing like how things work and how bodies move um and building images around that. So I think of that as one of these images. Um, um, I also think some of the like even more like early like static images are really lovely too. Like I, I got really interested in the lunar milk. Um, I think and partly because of its texture, partly because of the funny things characters did with it. But I also felt like I had a really good visual for it. Like, I've, there is no such thing, probably. Um, but, you know, I, I felt like I had a good imagine for it. For me, it's a little like Greek yogurt at times. Um, anyway. Um, I mean, it I, looks like Greek yogurt, but it tastes like, um, you know, like Korean fish sauce. <laughs> yeah, I could see nice. that. Um, anyway, I, I'm Something. babbling a little bit, and I'm sure there's more to say about XL. PTLX, um, as well as um, the deaf one that I've missed or overreached, you know. Um. I, I think, you know, Adam has chose, chosen the two characters that we get the most images of, mm-hmm. or at least the most in-depth images of. Right. Um, because, like, with uh, little Zithel, or however you want to say it, <laughs> Like, we we have, like, a full, like, couple of pages just describing her floating there, you know, with crayfish, sardines, limpets, squids, tentacles, you know. So, like, there's all kinds of, like, it's, it's very, like, specific. So. Yeah, listing is one of his mannerisms in this, I would say. And on the other hand, we have Mrs. Vidvid, who basically, I have no idea what she looks like, except that, uh, <laughs> you know, she's introduced by her, quote, breasts, which were round and firm, and the contact was good and secure, and had an attraction as strong as the moons were even stronger, especially if I managed, as I plunged down, to put my other arm around her hips, and with this, I pass back into our world. Right, end quote. And right, so like, sh- that's her introduction. Yeah. Which is a crazy introduction, and like, Quiff Whiff, you know, is basically uh, just describing the parts of her body that interest him. Yeah. And nothing else about her except that she plays the harp. Pretty much. Um, and, and to move back to the other character that's really described well, I think, is the deaf one. And like the kind of image I get is of, like, a very, like, youthful, charming boy, even though, like, he's generally described as clumsy. And the reason I get to that is most of his descriptions take place when he's on the moon. And when he's on the moon, he has this innate ability, without really trying, to find deposits of moon milk and stick his finger in, stick his toe in, you know, gather it up. He, one of the ways, which we haven't really discussed yet, is the way that they get the moon milk back to Earth is by throwing it from the moon back to Earth. And the deaf one can, like, pick up some of this milk and hurl it into a bucket on a ship on the Earth from the moon, which is an amazing feat. Through the competing gravitational forces that are able to hold up a small child. Yeah, Right, so he's crazy adept on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, Quiff Whiff describes himself as once, you know, he often throws it back and, like, it lands in the water and they have to go pick it up. Or even <laughs> one time he throws it and it doesn't even break the gravitational field, comes back and hits him in the face. <laughs> right, so, like, on the moon, the deaf one really is, like, in his element. 
and like he goes off to like hidden parts of the moon that no one else can go to. No one knows what he's doing back there. But it's like he's communing with the moon. And he becomes this like other entity when he's there. There's also some like beautiful descriptions of him like palming the moon and like holding it up like mm-hmm. a ball or like using a very long interconnected set of bamboo sticks <laughs> to like push at the moon and balance it and all different kinds of things, which ends up being the way that Quiff Whiff eventually gets back to Earth is through his deaf cousin. Um, and then I think maybe maybe my favorite like <laughs> description of a character uh, is, is about uh, the captain. Um, because we really don't get a whole lot about the captain. Uh, other than that, you know, he's in charge of this boat. Uh, his wife is Mrs. Vidvid. But, like, at one point, um, you know, we get, like, the usual seafarer uh, description of his face, you know. Uh, you know, it's ruddy from being outside all the time. It's weathered. It's, you know. But <laughs> the best one, I think, is really not a description of the captain as an image, but as an idea. Um, It's when his wife, uh, Mrs. Vidvich, uh, goes up to the moon the one time uh, to stay, and uh, the captain basically doesn't care. He just says, all right, we'll get going, you know. Um, And then uh, from the book... Quote, he wanted nothing better than to be rid of his wife. In fact, as soon as she was confined up there, we saw him give free rein to his inclinations and plunge into vice. Right? And so, like, how many possible things on a boat can he, like, plunge into vice immediately? I don't know, but it's crazy to imagine. <laughs> Which is why I really like that as an Im- imagistic description without an image. Because it's insane, and it, like, does the thing, you know, with... Like, it's like the reverse myth, in a way. Where, it like, you think of all the things that are considered vice now, and you're like, all right, but were all of those happening back then? No. So it's probably way weirder. And in, 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 you know, in thinking about all these, you know, you know, different, you know, sea animals and urchins and, and things like that. And like, whatever the other sailors are doing on board. Like, I don't know. But it, but it feels really strange. Yeah. Well, let's go with that, right? Like, so, Ingrid mentioned earlier that... You know, at least one time there are five people on a boat with three jobs. Uh, as you know, Captain Vidvid, uh, he's the captain, whatever that means, in this moon milking contest. Uh, but there are, there are other folks rolling around who are sort of ill-described. Is that about... I think one thing that I've been thinking about, including as you were talking, right, is that there's there's the story that's being told by Kifwif, and there's his reasons for telling the story, however he tells the story, and then there's the story as presented by the narrator who's introducing the situation, and then there are the people who are asking these questions who for some reason are not asking what the captain's vices are. Um, and then there's like Calvino who has invented all of these non-entity people with just strings of letter palimpsestic names Uh, how do you imagine the other people Uh, is that about brevity is that about Kifwisk's unreliability Um, are those people just there for some indescribable vice. Um, what's going on there? <laughs> well, I think that's a good question, um, and I think I interpreted you as asking this about like the larger world as well. Yeah, um, sure. So I mean, the, 
including um, the characters who are asking questions early on, and I mean, including like the world that these characters belong to at the time that the story is being told, as well as at the time um, that it's being narrated. Um, so, I mean, within the action of the story and when it's being told later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I mean, I think, you know, the possibilities that you offer there are good. Um, you know, is this about brevity? I, I do think that um, Calvino does a lot of work um, artfully establishing worlds early on. But, um, you know, I think even with such fanciful, inventive descriptions, um, you know, the baser reader in me wants to get to some action. Yeah. Um, and I'm ready for it when it comes. So I think, um, you know, mechanically, that may be about balancing the story a little bit and making sure that the front end especially doesn't get bogged down with too large a cast and, I mean, too much world that we're able to kind of focus in on this activity, this moon-centric activity. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know this this small crew, um, and you know I mean I think if Calvino hypothetically brought this story to me um, at the time that he was writing it and said you know is there enough of the other characters there do I need to try that I I think what I would say to him is like yeah go ahead try it see see how it looks. Um, I, I think that story could work too. I'm imagining a reason that it can't work from a slightly biased position and that I have a published story in front of me and I like it. Um, I think in terms of control too, um, I think especially with not, not showing us um, the characters who are asking the questions, um, stylistically what that does for me as a reader is it does put me in an imaginative place where I see the author's hand um, like I'm not in scene I'm not in a scene I can see um, and you know I mean I think writers do that all the time and it's a lovely move um, it is a move um, a choice and I mean that's that's how it works for me um, so I think actually like my answer for how I imagine characters is I actually like I'm kind of like a good little reader throughout this story and I, I really stay with it as it is um, so I don't go off and imagine what the question askers look like or what their reality is very much I'm really like imagining the beautiful violet colored fish in the water that Calvino is telling me about um, like my mind doesn't wander around the edges of the story um, which shows me that if that choice is about control, it's working for yeah. me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't really uh, think about them too much other than that they're little because of the amount of story time they get. Like, I, li I literally picture them smaller than, like, the other characters. Mm. Like, that's the one thing I do. And I think I'm allowed to do that <laughs> because of the mythos of the story. Anyway, I think part of the point, though, is, like, Quiff Whiff uh, is basically trying to be the main and only source of information for this. And by not naming or describing the other characters, not allowing his audience to go find another description from anyone, right? So, like, again, asserting his importance. Um... I mean, also, he is telling a story, and so, like, part of the story is, like, he's trying to focus on, like, keeping his audience interested, and so that might be part of why he doesn't describe them as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, did you have specific thoughts on, like, why you asked this question? Yeah, I think I ask it for a couple of reasons. One is, like, sort of practical and into the story, is that we do spend a lot of time figuring out how 
the moon milking process works. Um, and so I think that, like, the sort of functionary characters who are on the boat but presumably doing nothing or maybe are rowing or whatever is going on um, is interesting. I think they do come into play at the end when the moon, as it's moving away, um, is about to be the home for Mrs. Bivid and Kiflif, unless they can save these two, and they're all sort of trying to do the bamboo pole trick um, with exceptionally long poles to get them back. And, I mean, it's funny to watch them all come in and be after not being described, be incompetent, which I say about something they've never really had to do before. Um, and the kind of the kind of funny use of them as flat characters like uh, works for me. I think the other is um, I'm really in for for maybe a decade have been interested in this project of Calvino's. And um, in all the versions of this collection I've seen, um, some of which include later Cosmic Comics, so there's other samples of those later Cosmic Comics without these Cosmic Comics. In this book, um, the narrative isn't a linear progression, and so we get all kinds of scientific hypotheses, and I think if you put them sort of end-to-end -end from Kifwif in a gravitational singularity to Kifwif, the human being, um, they wouldn't make anything like sense, right? Um, and some of them have these kind of beautifully odd images that also don't entirely make sense, right? Like one story that sticks in my mind, which is almost entirely visual and operational and about Kifwif sort of controlling the story and being a pervert again, is Kifwif and another man are falling in parallel lines with a woman who's falling on a parallel line with them and she's always out of their reach and they never quite can reach her and they keep staring at her and he's sort of assuming that he's the one she would want or Kifwif is debating whether or not, right, Calvino doesn't in those other stories deal with consciousness as a problem, right? It's just there all the time and there's some kind of volition, according to Kifwif, right? So, like, people are deciding whether or not they want to stop being fish and move on to land, or, right, like, Kifwif is one of the last of the dinosaurs, and other creatures are moving on to post-dinosaur nests, and he doesn't want to get caught as a dinosaur, but he is checking out this other kind of post-dinosaur creature who's female. Um, I think it's something really critical to how flat and ancillary characters work across those stories um, and I think there's something sort of remarkable about his sense of humor and how he both wants to talk about the specifics of science and think that out but also how the only way for a story to work as a story is for us to engage in consciousness is for us to engage in sort of like a curiosity about it that doesn't let us in which is some of what makes it so weird and wonderful but also uh, I think maybe is the main justification for a narrator is aggravating as Kifwik is um, across those tales and so I think I'm thinking about it on both of those scales sort of how does it work for an unusual version of speculative fiction um, or what seems like an unusual version of me and the other is how does it work across the sort of like world building that, that Calvino is doing well I mean time. It, it does ask the question like how much can one person do yeah because Kifwif is narrating these other stories yeah, yeah, yeah. and also like one of the things in this story uh, you know You've already mentioned the poles that they unsuccessfully try to help uh, Kip with and Mrs. Vidvid back from the moon uh, with that are woefully short. Yeah. Like, at one point, several of them are actually 
on the moon or like coming back from the moon and they get stuck in the gravitational field like the difference between the earth and the moon's gravitational field and the captain says quote cling together idiots cling together the captain yelled at this command the sailors tried to form a group a mass to push all together until they reached the zone of the earth's attraction end quote and like you know i think of that in the same way as characterization they form a mass yeah they're literally a body of people that are there and have to be noted, but what can one person know about them? Yeah. Word. Um, well, I think a giant existential question <laughs> um, and that I'm not going to tap into, but I'm going to let listeners work through a little bit themselves. Uh, but before we ourselves uh, sort of push off into our own orbits and work on it, I thought we'd talk about the end of the distance of the moon. Um, at this point, the love story is sort of taken over the narrative, right? That's mm-hmm. what we're focused on. Um, there's this pretty literal cosmic shift in that the moon is being pushed away. Um, and I thought maybe I'd read some of this down and we could talk a little bit about why the story ends here. What do we make of the transition finally? And what do we make of this sort of like the conclusion and how it all wraps up finally? So I'm going to start just a little before the last paragraph, actually. Um, I no longer had to make any effort but could just allow myself to slide headfirst, attracted by the earth, until in my haste the pole broke into a thousand pieces, and I fell into the sea among the boats. My return was sweet, my home refound, but my thoughts were filled only with grief at having lost her, and my eyes gazed at the moon, forever beyond my reach as I sought her. And I saw her, She was there where I had left her, lying on a beach directly over our heads, and she said nothing. She was the color of the moon. She held the harp at her side and moved one hand now and then in slow arpeggios. I could distinguish the shape of her bosom, her arms, her thighs, just as I remember them now, just as now when the moon has become that flat remote circle. I still look for her as soon as the first sliver appears in the sky. And the more it waxes, the more clearly I imagine I can see her, her, or something of her, but only her in a hundred, a thousand different vistas. She who makes the moon the moon, and whenever she is full, sets the dogs to howling all night long. So, it's a, uh, it's a wild ending. Um, why, why are we finishing here? Um, well, I, I don't have a definitive, <laughs> definitive answer to that, but, um, you know, I mean, I can tell you what it does for me in particular as a reader, um, which is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> I think, I think for me, it actually, um, in a way, takes me back to the beginning and reminds me that I was thinking about this as, as myth. Um, I think I, I feel clearer on, on what this narrator feels toward um, Mrs. Vidvid, finally, um, this kind of hazy, romantic, nostalgic longing. Um, but, I mean... I haven't, I haven't studied myths very closely, so, I mean, forgive me if this is a little bit of a naive way to come at describing myths, but um, I think of them as sometimes um, starting from a question about why something is the way it is and kind of telling a story around that. You know, it, uh, the, the ending actually reminds me of a small moment in one of my favorite movies, um, The Dolce Vita, where Steiner is sort of 
tenderly describing um, some of the questions that his children ask. Um, and one in particular is, sticks with me. Um, who is the mother of the son? Um, I think when I come to the end of this story, I start to think about the questions that it could be answering. Um, why do dogs howl at the moon? Um, are there shapes on the moon? Are the presences? Do we do we see things on the crevices of the moon? Why is the moon so distant? Was it ever closer? Um, so I mean, I think my mind like goes to this space and opens back up and sends me back to the beginning again. Um, and you know, I mean, I think even though he is, as usual, objectifying Mrs. Vidvid, I think I think there's something very tender about this and. Um, it really feels like it's, as a story, it's pushed itself toward, um, toward the ending that feels most right. Something that I ask myself all the time as I'm reading is, could this story um, have ended a little sooner? Are there other moments that feel like ends to me? And, um, you know, I was really glad that, uh, Matthew brought up the moment where, um, the narrator's on the moon and realizing that he got his wish but that he's thinking of it as exile actually um and you know i mean to me that moment is so much about you know wanting something having a vision of what it'll be and experiencing that loss and coming to an understanding about it that that's a moment where i'm like yeah this has the power of an ending but I'm happy that this goes farther and takes us to a place where, you know, we're not only looking at the narrator differently, but we're also looking at the moon differently and we're reminded of the beginning of the story and we're kind of moving in this circular motion that feels very moon-like to me. Orbital. Orbital, indeed. Yeah, I mean, you know, to answer your question, why do we end the story here? It's because Kip ends the story here. Yeah. Like, that's the literal answer. Yeah. I think, <laughs> well, I think that's it in that, like, I think if I, if I were to end the story, I would probably end the story with, I, I read that partial sentence about him falling into the sea and, like, the bamboo shattering. And I think all the things I know about the deaf one and Mrs. Vidvid are tragic enough for me. But I'm, I think, like, I, I think why... But Kiff Whiffy isn't that dude, and I, which is interesting about it. It's, I think it's because of control. Yeah. Uh, he gets to control the ending. He can say whatever he wants. But I think, like, it does a couple of things, I think. One, it nicely wraps up the story. Yeah. Um, for what, like, a story, you know, it's, it's got, like, a mysterious, somewhat depressing, but also kind of somewhat happy ending. Yeah. Um, it it ends by returning to the status quo of what readers expect. There's the moon. Here's the earth. We're this distance away from each other now, and apparently it's not getting larger. Or at least Kipwiff hasn't told that story yet. Um, you know, um, but I think it's also important to the characters, or at least to Kipwiff, to like leave his listeners with the feeling that they somehow know more about the moon yeah. because the moon is such a big part of life like it's literally the biggest light on when the sun goes down yeah. and and so like you often go outside at night and you see the moon without even really thinking about it yeah you know it's just there it's always there um and so it's like trying to understand that and then understand how the moon actually affects the earth uh, with the tides, um, you know, different things like uh, the menstrual cycle, for example. Um, and, it, and it seems to be like pointing towards like an explanation of that without actually giving that explanation. Yeah. Um, and, and I think uh, one of the interesting things about the moon is that 
it does act like an idea of a deity in that it is above us and that we are below it and much smaller than it and we can't look directly at the sun thus the moon is the only actual celestial body you can see outside of stars so the biggest celestial body we can see with the naked eye that we can look at also obviously when you can't see everything else around you uh, the mind has different thoughts uh, and, and so like there's the, the mystery of the night and, yeah. and the moon is there and you know Ingrid brought up like uh, why do dogs howl at the moon and I think that's kind of like a human uh, concoction like dogs are just howling the moon just happens to be above them mm-hmm. and they're raising their necks yeah. and howling but, like, it does sound real good yeah. when you say howl at the moon instead of just, like, howl. Yeah. For whatever reason, there it, it comes in and there's that, like, little, like, mystery of, like, you know, only a few people have been to the moon. Right. Like, all the rest of us are down here being like, well, what the hell, man? Like, was it cool? Like, we saw some pictures, maybe some video. Yeah. But, like, you know, we never got to experience it. And even those people that got up on the moon couldn't really touch the moon. They were still barricaded inside a suit. Right. And so it like lends this aura of strangeness uh, to anything. Yeah. Finally, um, I think uh, the ending is a right, it's answering the question that like uh, is famously asked by like everyone. It's like, why can't I have what I want? Yeah. Right? Like everyone has desires and like it's true that, you know, certain desires may be able to be met, but, like, the desire of understanding the world, it's just not going to be met, you know? It, it's an impossible thing. And so, like, instead of, like, explaining why the moon ends up where the moon ends up, he explains why he doesn't get Mrs. Vidvid. Yeah, I think that's perfectly put. The only thing I'd add, um, I think partly because of something you said, Adam, um, is that, I mean, I think playing my game of, like, could this end sooner and better, um, I think one thing that's really, like, fabulous about that last beat is, you know, this whole paragraph is so lyrical and, I mean, almost like a little Baroque, (laughs) um, but lovely, and I think by taking it to sets the dogs to howling all night long and me with them, it, it brings in the colloquial and kind of like balances it tonally. And, um, you know, I mean, I think just does something to take something that we say all the time that's not especially poetic or imaginative, that's a little cliche, if anything, and like really do something new and remarkable with it. Um, and I think, you know, stylistically, that's just... A remarkable move. Uh, indeed. Um, I think it's a totally remarkable move. And as uh, Phantom the Cat is uh, clawing away and mewing, I think it's probably time to say that I, uh, I agree that Calvino does something really special, not only here but often, right? Like he was obviously a big, uh, a major writer of Italian folktales. Um, someone who's familiar with the sort of Persephone, Demeter myth and the negotiations of that kind of thing. And I think he brings that kind of mythic um, to, right, like, I don't want to say science communication, that makes it sound like uh, too technical, right? Like he, two questions of his own time. Um, Mm. And I think that that's, wonderful and I'd encourage everyone to go dig on some Italo Calvino uh, on that note thank you folks for uh, for helping me think this one out thanks Adam thanks Matthew thanks for taking us to space <laughs>